People are losing their mind over J.D. Vance because J.D. Vance has now been selected as Trump's VP pick and he's one of our guys. I say that because he follows you. He does. Hilarious. He seems to be very well read in our circles and we, we'll be getting on to just exactly how. But it's not just the Biden, formerly Biden, now Harris campaign that are putting out videos scaremongering about his positions that actually look like campaign endorsements. Yeah. And it's not just the typical tabloid press that are petrified of his post-liberalism. It's people that are ostensibly on our side that are worried about Vance. And I think it's worth looking at the fault lines of the anti-woke coalition as we go forward and, as Jack Posobiec said at NatCon, conservatives and reactionaries and traditionalists learn that if you have no power but principles, you're losing. If you have power and then do not use it, then you're delusional. Mm. So they're going to use power. It's a sensible thing to do. But anyway, look, we as soon as Vance was selected, we were expecting that they were going to put out videos like this. This is from a uh, Biden's account. J.D. Vance has extreme views, and he's not hiding it. He supported banning abortion with no exceptions for rape or incest. I certainly would like abortion to be legal nationally. He'd replace government employees with Trump loyalists. I think that what Trump should do, <laughs> fire every single mid-level bureaucrat, every civil servant in the administrative state, replace them with our people. And admitted he wouldn't have certified the results of the 2020 election. Do I think there were problems in 2020? Yes, I do. Sound familiar? It's all part of Trump's Project 2025 agenda for a full takeover of our daily lives. And J.D. Vance is not trying to hide that either. There's some good ideas in there. An extreme running mate for an extreme agenda. All I'm just going to say that their editing it makes it sound great. Oh, no, he's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I do think the reason he was, he was picked is because Trump has been poo-pooing Project 2025 in the public recently. But the architects of Project 2025, which is just a, a salient way of ensuring that the deep state and pure bureaucracies don't block Trump's gender again, yeah. um, those guys are friendly with and inspired by J.D. Vance. I mean, I spoke to the guys over at American Moment, and they said the reason we set it up and called it American Moment is because J.D. Vance once wrote an essay that said we need a training body for young, enterprising potential politicians like himself, who were in deprived areas, as he details in Hillbilly Elegy, that can go and get experience on Capitol Hill. And so that's what they did. And that's why there are many CVs now. And I think that's why Trump has selected him, to actually implement the agenda. I also think there's an element of insurance about it as well. Uh, I mean, I think Trump's vice president pick is also insurance in the sense that if he picked the wrong person, taking another crack at him, would have been, uh, you know, would have would have remained an option. I think he has an air now in the way that he didn't before. I mean, one of the things when I wrote that piece, the return of the great MAGA king for Islander magazine, uh, I said, you know, Trump, the succession is a problem. Trump doesn't have a clear successor, and so if he'd appointed, God forbid, Nikki Haley, you know, God. I mean, I'm sure there would have been another attempt on his life because then then the uniparty gets the presidential candidate it wants. I mean, J.D. Vance is whatever criticisms you want to make of him, then he is the closest thing to Trump among the potential, uh, other than Tucker, let's say. But I don't think that that was ever going to happen. Um, it's a real shame, because I think that would have been the best. Yeah, me too. Me too. Making him press secretary is still an option. Sure, but... Hulk Hogan, I, too. Can, can I just say, I'm actually on the side that I think J.D. Vance was a bad pick. Uh, now... I appreciate the misogynist neckbeard representation. <laughs> I really do. Right. I feel seen. Um, but I called this, like, it was a week ago when he was chosen. Uh, and I called it on, I was doing a Twitch stream at the time. I was like, look, he is not, women are going to look at him and be like, I hate him. I absolutely hate him. As, and Trump's weakest demographic is with women. As one of my other favorite anons, Radfem Hitler, has said, he is radioactive to online hosts yeah. who and will I, come out and vote against him. It's not that they were going to vote for Trump. It's yeah. that they will come out and vote against him in force, which is a liability. But also, I saw one post and it had like 30,000 likes on it. It was going around from a woman who was like, look, I'm a center-right woman. I hate everything that Biden and Kamala have done. But I viscerally hate Vance on a, on a gut level, on a spiritual level. I find him repulsive and I hate him. And... People are like, well, okay, well, don't you feel that way about Trump? She's like, no, I don't feel that way about Trump. Because Trump, for, for all his faults, doesn't come across with a kind of energy that radiates a kind of subconscious hatred of women, right? Trump doesn't come across that way. He actually comes across quite a well-meaning boomer. He's charming, yeah. Yeah, he's actually kind of charming. But Vance has got a kind of look on his face 
a kind of angry energy about him that women don't like. And, you know, like, you know, I'm not saying that I don't like him. I think he's great. We went to NatCon, we saw his speech, and it was by far the best speech. Spoke to me as a, you know, neckbeard. I was like totally on board, but I could instantly tell that women are not going to like this guy. And it seems that that's true. And that's Trump's weakest area. Well, this is why people thought, and all the noises I had heard that it was down to Vance and Rubio and Rubio had expected it. This is yeah. why he flew back on Tuesday at NatCon to yeah. Florida. We all thought it was going to be the appointment there. It wasn't just that he could speak Spanish and trounce then Kamala in a Telemundo debate and that he had good intelligence agency connections to try and prevent them from blockading Trump's agenda. It was that he had the Trudeau effect where he was a bit more clean cut and amenable to suburban women. Yeah, and women, that was that was wargamed. Women didn't feel threatened by Rubio, but I think they do in some way feel threatened by Vox. Not that they think personally he's going to attack me or something, but that he's going to make them second class citizens. Well, he he does criticise some of them in yeah. in a hilarious clip from uh, from obviously Tucker as well. What I was basically saying is that we're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via via our corporate oligarchs by a bunch of childless cat ladies who are miserable at their own lives and the choices that they've made. And so they want to make the rest of the country miserable too. And it's just a basic fact. You look at Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, AOC, the entire future of the Democrats is controlled by people without children. And how does it make any sense that we've turned our country over to people who don't really have a direct stake in it? I mean, I, like I said, I totally agree with him. Totally speaks to me, but now you can see why all the awfuls are suddenly like, right, Kamala Harris is going to be our savior when this is the alternative. But but also not the awfuls. I mean, I think a lot of reasonable women are just put yeah, off yeah. by that kind of rhetoric. 100%. I think it's... Um... It's vibes based. You can't really get around it, unfortunately. Mm. So what what about the, obviously, the childless cat ladies and, and the like who are never going to vote for him in the first place, but could be a liability because they turn out to vote against him in force but, are but, a problem. But it's not that. It's, it's the reasonable women who aren't Childless cat ladies. Yes. You know, they probably are mums who have kids who get on with their lives, got jobs or whatever, and they don't like him either. They might be appeased by if they're intelligent, putting Ushra and the kids first and foremost in most of his campaign materials. But that's but that's, that's a softening of the blow. But the the problem there is that you're putting the onus on them to decide to choose you. Where what you're supposed to do is make yourself so appealing. They think, yeah, I like that guy. I'm going to vote for him because, like you said, all politics is based on vibes, really. Yes. And he just has the wrong vibes when it comes to half the demographic of the voting block base. Yes. Well, among our own people, it's not that he's failing a vibe check, it's failing an ideas check, which is quite curious. And so, really? yes, because there's a there's a Wall Street Journal article and in his speech at NatCon, he did say he likes to take a pot shot at the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Oh. So they're taking a pot shot at him. They're noting his post-liberal connections. And it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, he It's it's notable as well that he, he opened... Look, Anyway, uh, he's, it says, Mr. Vance identifies himself as a member of the post-liberal right, the first Republican candidate for such a high office to do so, and he attributes most of his philosophical foundations to the likes of Patrick Deneen, Adrian Vermeule, Charles Taylor, Alistair McIntyre, um, notably you, as you are on the panel today. Uh, hello, Mr. Future Vice President, if you're watching. And it notes that many post-liberals are Catholic, as is Mr. Vance. Again, hello, my bad. So Vance swims in our, in our waters quite a lot. So the Politico have profiled some of the people that... that uh, influenced his thinking. And they've listed Patrick Deneen. I think we've all read why liberalism failed. What's interesting is that Deneen is the PhD supervisor for Yoram Hazoni's son, Yoram Hazoni, who is the guy who runs NatCom. So very enmeshed in that network. The Wall Street Journal says of, of Deneen that he's post-liberalism's clearest articulator. And they cite regime change, which is a strange thing because regime change is a more recent book where he said they need to double the size of Congress, which is a, a weird thing to to propose, but it says that it's guided by common good conservatism focused on virtue, family, and community. Oh no, how terrible. I yeah. don't know why you would possibly oppose those things. It also notes Peter Thiel in here. Now, Peter Thiel is a very interesting pick. He is. Because Peter Thiel donated to Vance's Senate race. Right. And Didn't Vance work for Peter Thiel? I believe that the he his venture capital firm had also invested in Palantir. I don't know if he worked directly under him. Mm. Check me on that. <clears throat> the reason I also mark out Peter Thiel is a few weeks ago, I hope I don't get in trouble for leaking this, I, I went to a, a little seminar thing with, with Peter Thiel, and it was meant to be on globalism, and people thought it was going to be an economic seminar. It was almost entirely about preventing the rise of the Antichrist. Okay. <laughs> Peter Thiel is properly plugged into <laughs> eschatology. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I don't really want the Antichrist to come here. No, it would be, it would be useful. So the, the whole 
Catholic post-liberalism angle has taken in Teal on an ideas level, and that's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, also notes Curtis Yarvin, congrats on the recent wedding. Um, I, I did like this this particular meme from uh, Cunley Drukpa here, um, which is that Yarvin over the weekend apparently said, you might know more about this, that we should turn unproductive people into biodiesel. It's. Uh, I think that's one of his um, more famous essays. I think he says that. Right. Basically. And so they've they've dug it up once they've made the association with uh, with Yarvin. Then what they do, of course, what they do is they dig up the worst thing that you know the thinker has said. And to most people, the idea of turning libtards into biodiesel and <laughs> using them to run municipal buses is probably. About as far beyond the pale as you could get, I, I think. I thought that was Californian state policy because weren't they going to sustainably recycle everyone's corpses? You've got to do something after the maid has kicked in. <laughs> so, hey, it's biodegradable. What can what can you say? <laughs> I just I just like the the, the director reference to. Uh, so Curtis, we've won. What do we do now? Um, uh, um, uh, to, you need to like um, uh, read Soviet history, I suppose. Uh, the other influences were Rene Girard, who's very good on scapegoating, Sora Bamari. Yeah, that's a curious one, considering recent events over at Compact and with Nina Power and Lomez, but I'd, I'd say beware having that person in your circle. Uh, the Claremont Institute, who you write for, and Rod Dreyer, who is a friend of mine, um, who went to, I believe it was Vance's first Holy Communion, who compared Vance to Frodo, saying he's a veritable hillbilly hobbit. And did you see the, pi- did you see the picture uh, Rod Dreyer posted of himself with Vance? And his ex-wife, Rodrea's ex-wife, and he um, replaced his ex-wife's face with a giant oyster. <laughs> I didn't Have we not? Uh, this why? Is, yeah, this is in, it's it's insane. It's one of the the most bizarre things I've ever seen. Uh, I couldn't. It's it's worse than any kind of parody I could ever come up with for Man's World. Rodrea, oh here's my ex-wife. Uh, she's uh, she likes to maintain her privacy. I've replaced her face with a giant oyster. Yeah, he posted it yesterday or the day before. How nice. I'm going to text him and ask him what that's all about. Uh, <laughs> so I mentioned his Rule of the Rings reference because this was another amusing article that might we might all enjoy. Um, apparently, J.D. Vance is a big fan of the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Based. Like I said, I, don't, I, I like, you know, Vance ever watched this and like, oh, this guy hates me. No, I think I think he's great, actually. Like I said, his his NatCon speech is amazing. I, to- I mean, I would love if that were uh, an article about me. Yeah. You know, the... the this is just selling him to me. The beard doesn't look dissimilar, actually, in this. Beard, no, it doesn't. Which is kind of strange. Like this is just totally selling it to me. In a 2021 podcast, he said that Tolkien was his his favorite writer. I suppose that makes sense when, of course, Peter Thiel named his firm Palantir, yeah. and Vance invested in another defense company called Andril, which is obviously the sword that Aragorn reforges from the yeah. shards of Narsil. Um, but th- this connection to the military industrial complex is why the RFK is calling him a CIA candidate, which I think is just. Despite, despite the fact that his campaign is run by his daughter-in-law who worked for the CIA for 16 years. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so Luke, Luke Burgess, who's a author of a book about Gerard and works at Catholic University of America, says that Vance's appreciation of Tolkien is not unrelated to his conversion to Catholicism in 2019. Of the many ways that Tolkien's work exemplifies the Catholic imagination, one is the relationship between the visible and the invisible. It's fair to say Vance believes there's a real spiritual evil in this world and it can be embodied in rituals and rites. Vance likely took away from Tolkien an apocalyptic frame of mind, Burgess said, a final and all-encompassing battle between good and evil. I find it very interesting that, obviously, Tucker, who's good friends with Vance, also spoke in the same terms when delivering a speech at Heritage, wasn't it, last year? Mm. There's a seeming perception yeah. at NatCon there that their political <clears throat> enemies are embodying some sort of demonic agenda. Do you know what's really interesting? I recorded a video today that should be out tomorrow about, uh, it's just going to be called The American Fellowship. Because I really, I really can see the parallels in the American politics with Lord of the Rings at this point, mm. right? You've got an, an evil industrial coalition against what are basically a bunch of hobbits and uh, you know a bunch of well-meaning you know gurus and stuff like that. And the fact that they're prepared to start memeing this into a reality as well is superb. I mean, it just everything's aligning. I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm totally in favour of us having this kind of mythological understanding mm. of our own pol- political lives. You know, no, no, you're part of a grand story mm. where you're going to defeat Sauron, mm. notably the, the Democrat Party, in a climactic battle, and they're all just going to crumble, and it's going to be, you know, goodness and light. You're going to go live in a hobbit hole and marry a, a lovely little hobbit and have dozens of little hobbit kids. Everyone get on board. This is superb. Having just rewatched it over the weekend, I agree. Yeah. And in this article, it does make the point that I hope you made in yours, which I haven't seen yet, is that, the Shire is all well and good. 
you need the men of Gondor and Rohan to protect it. Yeah. That's the kind of class of people that need to be built to fend off the... Yeah, yeah one, I, I didn't have to make that point, but like, it, it's just superb that this is what's mapping on to the right at this point. No, we are where the goodness lies, and we're all good, and they are all evil, and they're just where the badness lies. And just get that in your head. You know, get that in your head. These are the villains trying to ruin the Shire. That's where we are. That dichotomy of good and evil, though, is profoundly post-liberal, oh, as yeah, we 100%, know. Yeah, yeah. And this is the thing that people on our side are balking with. So there's a quote from that Wall Street Journal piece that says, The post and post-liberal comes in part from the claim that today's social and moral problems are the inevitable result of the liberal regime set up by the founding fathers. Some post-liberals argue the founders made a critical philosophical mistake baked into the American system is a wrong-headed rejection of an objective standard for goodness, truth, and beauty. Post-liberals therefore talk openly about the need to create a new blueprint for an American society centered on virtue and the common good. This is what they're worried about. And this has led to some counter-signaling by people who are ostensibly on the right. Just to uh, say, that's not an inaccurate characterization of the philosophical problems with the founding of the United States. Yeah. The problem is the United States is the quintessentially classically liberal project and contains within it all of the flaws of liberalism. But the question is why it's a liberal system. And I don't think that it's just about ideas. I think it's about demographics and ethnicity. And I think it's about the fact that America is fundamentally an Anglo nation. And I've, an Anglo ethno state. And I've exactly. And I've written about this. And that's the, that's the unspoken context of the founding. It didn't need to be said, this is an Anglo nation, because it was an Anglo nation. They didn't have to write that down on paper. So, I mean, I wrote a piece for American Mind for the Claremont Institute about, I think it was about Tucker's interview with um, Vladimir Putin, actually, where I talked about post-liberalism and the fact that I think personally that the post-liberal diagnosis is wrong in certain fundamental respects because it assumes that America is, is a liberal nation um, First. ideologically rather than being an, uh, an outgrowth of the Anglo way of life. So there's a great book called um, The Origins of English Individualism by Alan McFarlane, an anthropologist, and he basically looks at English society back to about the sort of Anglo-Saxon period. And he says, look, English people were liberals in their way of life. They were radical individualists. Uh, they moved around a lot. They had geographical mobility. They didn't really look after their parents very well. They had uh, truncated nuclear families. Uh, there was a market economy. In the early Middle Ages, liberalism is an outgrowth of the Anglo way of life. It's a codification of the Anglo way of life. And so, I mean, I see post-liberalism almost as putting the seal on demographic change in the US. That's how I see it. I think like post-liberalism works as an explicitly Catholic ideology for the most part because you've got lots of Mexicans, you've got lots of um, people coming from Latin America who are Catholics. I think that's why it works. And that's the interesting dynamic, I think. Can I just pick up on that? Because you, you're exactly right. And this is the point we've made as well. It's li liberalism is the abstraction of the Anglo-Saxon tradition of mm -hmm. politics, how we think society should be run and how just naturally we live our lives when left mm -hmm. without interference. And I've made the point, this turns it into a kind of like Anglo-Sharia, right? I'm not even joking. This is mm -hmm. kind of like Sharia law, but for English people. Mm -hmm. And it's inappropriate to imply, apply it on non-English people. Mm -hmm. And when it's applied on non-English people, like the French or the Russians or whoever, mm -hmm. the liberal precepts destroy their civilizations. Mm -hmm. They turn to massive, insane revolutions. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Anglo countries, everything just carries on as normal because we've got the natural social institutions that uphold mm -hmm. these principles. And so all you're doing is parroting back to you what you already believe. And so it doesn't change anything. And that's why America can call itself a liberal nation and not go through an insane social revolution. But like I say, the demographic changes now. Well, who is part of the radical left-wing coalition that wants insane changes in the United States? Well, it's awfuls and minorities, people who are not naturally part of that coalition, are not naturally part of the sort of Anglo world. And so it's just like, okay, well, I'm happy for liberalism as long as we accept that it's for the Anglos. You know, it's like the Muslims with Sharia. Sharia is for the Muslims, liberalism is for the Anglos. You know, that's how that can only work. And when it doesn't work like that, well, then we have to go beyond liberalism. We have to accept that we've got to move into some other paradigm. Von, Vons gets this because at, at NatCon and at the RNC, and you can watch his full speech in, in your own time, he articulated that America is not just a nation of ideas. It's not just a set of values or principles. It's a homeland. It's a people. It's a nation. And that he has a plot of land in... 
cold country Kentucky, where seven generations of his family, going back to the Civil War, have fought and died to defend the country. And they've defended it because it is their home where their family and their children reside and where they'd like to be laid to rest someday. And he hopes that he can preserve American prosperity to the extent where his children can lay him to rest, him and his wife, in that same plot alongside his ancestors. Much of the same substance was delivered at NatCon. I thought it was very good. It was a good rejoinder to some more of the ideas-based Christian nationalism that Josh yeah. Hawley delivered on night one. He understands it. This drove the fusionist and left left me faction mental. And we'll go first. So ben. Drove ben oh, I was gonna yeah, Ben Shapiro. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, ben, ben Shapiro, Shapiro mental. Yeah. Um Ben Shapiro <coughs> is a conservative in the sense of he's conserving liberalism. Hmm. And I think this might be derived from the fact that as a racial and religious minority in America, he wants to preserve the liberal principle of freedom of religion rather than having an established church or an established dominant host nation, for example. And Shapiro was very pedantic about Vance's point yeah. and refused to admit the demographic factors, which mean that a home is kept a certain way because the homeowners keep it like that, not the house guests. But also, just a quick thing, facts don't care about your feelings. Well, it is a fact that Vance is correct about the description of the history and demography of the United States. It's just uncontestable. Advanced speech is getting a lot of attention is his point, and it was also made by the World War II veteran who spoke yesterday, that America is not just an idea, it's a homeland, which of course is absolutely true. Here is, here is Senator Vance last night. America is not just an idea. It is a group of people with a shared history and a common future. It is, in short, a nation. Now, it is part of that tradition, of course, that we welcome newcomers. But when we allow newcomers into our American family, we allow them on our terms. People will not fight for abstractions, but they will fight for their home. And if this movement of ours is going to succeed, and if this country is going to thrive, our leaders have to remember that America is a nation and its citizens deserve leaders who put its interests first. Super. Okay, now, again, I agree with everything he's saying. I'm just not sure what he's arguing against. Because obviously America is a nation. France is also a nation. Poland is also a nation. Right? When he says that America is a land, yes, so is literally every other land. That's true. And America happens to be the best land. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. It's the best land and it's the best nation. But why? Why? And the answer is the idea that's connected to those things. So he says that America is not just an idea. And of course, that's true. I think the thing that he's arguing against, and, and here I agree with him, I think the thing he's arguing against is this sort of abstracted idea that Joe Biden uses all the time, where he says, it's not who we are. And what he means by that is, it's not who the left is. Okay, the attempt to universalize American values in the sense that they can either be exported to Iraq or imported from Guatemala. That's silly, and it's wrong. And I think that's what he's saying right there. That, but that's exactly <clears throat> your point, Ben, when you said you didn't care about the browning of America. Yeah. Right? You are saying that, okay, fine, the values are abstracted and therefore disconnected from the people who hold them, who produce them, and therefore it doesn't matter if those people no longer exist. Mm. And Magic soil theory. It, which yes, doesn't apply to Israel. But also, like you can say, well, like, you know, we've you know, we've spoken to these guys over in these countries, and they say, Yeah, we agree with liberal liberal values too, then we can just take an infinite number of them. And it's like, okay, but the liberal values are one legalistic right the, it's, the, it's a social contract as in it's your relationship with the government it doesn't really say all that much about your relationships with one another and that is all left unsaid in the anglo tradition right we we've, we've got and we've got lots of culture and customs that frankly americans don't really have nearly as much as the older anglo world has right like saying please and thank you when someone serves you a till but the americans just don't and it's really rude right and so there there are so many other like unspoken social customs that prop all of the legalistic nature of the Anglo beliefs up that they just don't seem to get. And so Ben, sorry, I know I'm going on, but this is very frustrating. He's I being think, totally disingenuous. I mean, he I, knows that Vance actually is arguing against him. Yeah, he must know. Right? Yeah. He must know. Otherwise, What is a Nation will be Daily Wire's next documentary if he doesn't understand that it's not just the landmass, it's the people that then generate the values. And I, I, say, yeah. I say it doesn't apply to Israel because, understandably, he wouldn't want the same rules to apply. He wouldn't want it to be civic nationalists because they have enemies on all sides. Well, so does America now, pouring through its southern border. And so it does pose a threat to the structural integrity of the American project and its continuity. And so 
it's not fair to say treat them the same. And lots of the Jews that go to NatCon understand the same thing. Oh, yeah. Because now they're going, ah, all of that immigration hasn't been exactly great for anti-Semitism on college campuses, has it? It was not a very wise move. Now, to, just to cap this off, we'll, we'll go to uh, resident liberal uh, James Enzi, um, who has been, per his post on Christian nationalism, constantly counter-signaling J.D. Vance. Sure. My primary concern with Vance isn't that he's a problem in and of himself, though I strongly disagree with his post-liberty philosophy. <laughs> not liberalism, post-liberty. He's harmonized the concepts. Uh, you know what? I'm, I, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. No, no. The, no, the, no, English, no. the, the, English, were, the English had a degree of liberty without needing liberal ideology. No, no, no. no. Liberty being a Latin word. Liberty, not license. Yes. But li liberty being a Latin word is alien and foreign. No, we have freedom. We have the old, earthy Anglo-Saxon freedom. You can keep your French liberty all you want. It's something weird and alien, and I don't believe in it. I believe in English freedom. So yes, they can keep that. But his main complaint is, it's that the administrative apparatus he wants to maintain gets staffed with similar but more radical ideologues through his position. He is against yeah, but sacking, sacking them. As a yeah, but they're not James Lindsay's guys. I know. the point. It's... It's this belief in neutral institutions, even though the, the so-called neutral institutions are the exact thing yep. that have been inflicting the ideologies that James has been campaigning against for ages. But also, what's the alternative? Well, the neutral institutions should be staffed by partisan leftists. Mm. And what, what, why would we call it a neutral institution? He's like a, ki he's like a kid in the playground who's constantly squirming in front of a bully and saying, you know, punch, punch him, punch him instead. Um, it's, it's amazing that even now James Lindsay doesn't understand that Actually, so much of the American system isn't salvageable. Oh, yeah. And just the very nature of the sort of floating ideals of neutral liberalism mm. is such an obviously false conceit that the classical liberals are holding at this point. Well, like this. He needs to clarify his views on enlightenment liberalism, <laughs> scaring people off in droves as are most of his ardent supporters. It's like, no, no, the enlightenment liberalism is the thing that's pried America away from its founding ethos and stock. That, that is the issue. Uh, also, his, his, his main complaint with Vance's speech, the entire woke anti-woke fight is a fight of abstractions. Only if you deny the peoples that generated the ideas that you purport to believe in. Because if you think these ideas just came from the ether, ex nihilo, at the advent of the enlightenment bond by nobody in particular, then it's an idea of abstractions. Rule of law isn't an abstraction. Rule of law is custom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they, I mean, that's that's just an that's an absolute non sequitur, and, and it doesn't com follow. It's completely concrete when someone is arrested or not arrested. Yeah, depending on the crime, it's it's absolutely yeah. something real. Yeah, it's not Gnostic Marxism to notice oh. that the English yeah. generated these ideas. Yeah. Uh, and he's also then accusing Vance of using the rhetoric of blood and soil, which he never did, which would be kind of inconvenient because he has an Indian wife. No, because he's not talking about racial purity. And the, the, this this is another problem is that, like. Vance is speaking to something, again, that is concrete. He is speaking to a web of relations and inheritances, which is very much mapped onto the real world. Blood and soil is, again, another abstract category where it could be where literally anything in the category is totally fungible. What Vance is speaking about is, in a Tolkien-esque way, unique named individuals who occupy a particular place and time who are not replaceable. Right? They are always there, and they will always be them in that place. And for all time, they will have been them in that place. Whereas blood and soil nationalism is just give me a person with white skin and I have a white person and therefore I'm satisfied. It's an interchangeable, fungible category. That's not what Vance is saying. No. So the only good thing that Lindsay did recommend is to paradoxically rewatch <laughs> your chat with him because he seems to think that yourself and Vance have the same idea. And I agree. Carl made some great points in this discussion. Yeah. And I look forward to the second American founding by our hillbilly Caesar. <laughs> I, a, I was right about everything in that discussion, and B, Vance is right because, I, like I said, I feel very represented by Vance because we're very clearly on the same page when it comes to a more mythological, holistic view of the world rather than an abstract categorical view of the world. It's obviously the right way to look at things, and that's what post-liberal means at, at the base, I think. Yeah, go on, Kentucky Aragorn. Thanks for watching, folks. If you think we're doing a good job and you'd like to support us, you can go over to lotuseas.com and for £5 a month, help us keep the lights on because, of course, we are demonetized on YouTube. And while you're there, come and hang out with us at Lads Hour. The only way I can really describe this is like the view for men, where we, the lads, sit around and discuss a particularly interesting topic of the day. This particular one was on whether we should or should not cancel the left, and I won't spoil the conclusion that we came to. And uh, go and follow us over on Twitter slash X at loadseaters underscore com.